Hello and welcome to Study Shack JA, where we are going to be going through the CSEC Physics Pass Paper 2, January 2023. This is an excellent opportunity for students who are preparing for their CSEC Physics examinations this year to get some extra practice in so that you can become familiar with the exam format. And I will go through step by step each question breaking down the problem and discussing the concepts and techniques that you're going to need to find the solutions and whether you're struggling with physics or you're looking to fine tune your skills this video is perfect for you to help you prepare for the upcoming exams so grab a pen and paper get ready to take some notes and let's dive in all right so let's begin with question 1a define the period of a simple pendulum an answer I have here is simply the time taken by the pendulum to complete one oscillation. Or 1B, the table shows the results of the experiment to find the relationship between the length of a string L and the period of a pendulum T. Now, the first thing that we need to do, we need to look at the table. There's a blank space. There's a few blank spaces right there. So, it says period square. All right. So, that means we need to turn our period values, we need to square them and add them to this side of the table. So that's what I'm gonna go ahead and do for you guys quickly in the interest of time. E1, all right? State the independent manipulated variable in this experiment. And that would be length, okay? That would be length, all right? Now, B3, using the grid, provided in figure one um, on page five we're going to plot a graph of period square so t square against length in summary we use a period square when analyzing a simple pendulum because it allows us to more easily study the relationship between the period and other values such as the length of the pendulum and the acceleration due to gravity the graph has been plotted for you already you can stop the video and and check to see if the points that you did were correct just like mine. Question C. So calculate the gradient S of the graph on page 5. In order to calculate our gradient, we need to determine our coordinate pairs. And of course, the formula y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1. We're going to use that to calculate our gradient. Starting with D. So Question D, given that S is equal to 4 pi squared over G, calculate the acceleration due to gravity. So that's what G means. So starting with the equation, S is equal to 4 pi squared over G, where S is the period squared of a simple pendulum. We can solve for G by rearranging the equation. All right, so we're going to rearrange, rearrange the equation, right, so that we can solve for, for G. Therefore, to calculate the acceleration due to gravity, we need to divide 4 pi squared by the period squared. So the reason why we do this is that it allows us to determine the acceleration due to gravity by measuring the period of a simple pendulum. All right, By measuring the period of a pendulum and plugging it into the above equation, we can calculate the acceleration due to gravity, which is a fundamental constant of nature. To see if our values that we had above with our period and so on and so forth was correct because g is supposed to be a constant value question two so question 2a says that we must complete the following statement by filling in the blanks with the correct word or phrase so ai the formula for pressure and its unit is blank or blank so what should go in the blank so in si units is pascal its si unit is pascal or newtons per square meter okay n, n over m squared and the explanation here is that pressure is defined as the force applied per unit area and the formula for pressure expresses this relationship mathematically they say unit for pressure is pascal which is equivalent to one newton per square meter so this means that if a force of one newton is applied to an area of one square meter the resulting pressure would be one pascal so 2a2 now in fluids pressure at all points on the same horizontal level 
is blank and the, what should go there in the blank is equal and pressure increases as the blank increases and what should go there is depth question 2 a 3 an object will float in a fluid when the blank which is when the, bo the buoyant forces acting upward on the object is equal to the blank of the object weight question b1 says calculate the depth of the shipwreck below the surface of the sea given that the gravity is 10 newtons per kilogram the atmospheric pressure is 100 kilopascals and the density of sea water is 1025 kilograms per meter cube the formula here p is equal to rho times gravity times height which relates the pressure at a given depth to the density of the fluid the acceleration due to gravity and the depth of the fluid now we can rearrange the formula to solve the depth of the shipwreck so we have the height is equal to the pressure over density times gravity now that we substitute the values that we were given substituting the values we get 41.95 meters so the calculation involves the application of that of the formula that we just used which relates the pressure at a given depth to the density of the fluid the acceleration due to gravity and the depth of the fluid and by using the given values and the pressure on the top of the shipwreck and the density of seawater we can solve for the depth of the shipwreck below the surface of the sea. Resulting, the resulting depth tells us how far the shipwreck is submerged in the water. Let's calculate the total pressure on top of the shipwreck. So using the same formula, pressure is equal to um, density times gravity times the depth. We can calculate the hydrostatic pressure at a depth of 41.95 meters. All right. So... We'll be doing two calculations. First, we need to calculate the, the pressure of the pressure of the water. All right. So let us go. So we know that the density of the seawater is 1,025, okay, times the gravity times the depth. So we should get 430,000 pascals now the atmospheric pressure at sea level is typically around 100 kilopascals so we're going to work out the total pressure by calculating the pressure of the water plus that of the atmosphere so that's 430,000 plus 100,000 so we should get 530,000 pascals so question three here a hatch door on top of the surface of the shipwreck has an area of 0.60 meters square now they want us to calculate the downward force on the hatch door due to the total pressure on the top surface of the shipwreck so we can use the formula force is equal to pressure times area okay so in this case we are given the total pressure on top on the top surface of the shipwreck which is 530,000 pascals now the hatch door has an area of 6, 0 0.60 meters square. So we can substitute these values under the formula to get, okay, for 530,000 pascals times 0 0.60 meters squared. So that we should get force, which is 318,000 newtons. All right, so let's move on to question three. So question three, A1. Now the figure three shows a section of a white plastic pipe through which water is flowing the water in the pipe is heated by the sun. The question AI says that we should describe how thermal energy is transferred from the sun to the water inside the pipe. So the answer that you should have or the, around the lines of... So the answer that you should have is... So the thermal energy is transferred from the sun to the pipe via radiation. Now this is, this is a transfer of heat energy through space by electromagnetic radiation. And the pipe transfers the heat to the water via conduction. And heat then flows by the mass movement of water molecules via conduction. Question AI says that we should suggest two ways in which the efficiency of the thermal energy absorbed by the water in the pipe may be increased. So one way in which we could use is increase the surface area of the pipe. Okay, and the explanation here is by when we increase the surface area of the pipe, Right? That is, we expose it to more sunlight, so more solar radiation can be absorbed, which leads to more efficient transfer 
of thermal energy to the water. So this can be achieved by using a pipe with a larger diameter or by increasing the length of the pipe. All right. Then the second one is improve the thermal insulation around the pipe. Okay. By, and the explanation here is just by improving the thermal insulation around the pipe, heat loss to the surrounding can be minimized, which leads to more efficient transfer of thermal energy to the water. And this can be achieved by using insulating materials such as foam or by wrapping the pipe with other insulation materials and you'll get your two marks. Question B says, Rachel used a metal spoon to stir a hot liquid in a cup as shown in figure 4. Now B1 says, after a short time, Rachel observed that the metal spoon felt hot. So describe the two ways in which the thermal energy is conducted through the metal spoon at a molecular level. So here are two ways, vibrational energy and the movement of free electrons. Now one, vibrational energy, when the spoon is placed in, a, in the hot liquid, the molecules of the liquid are going to start colliding with the molecules of the metal spoon. Okay, this collision causes the atoms and molecules in the metal spoon to vibrate faster and that increases their kinetic energy. So this increased kinetic energy is then transferred from one molecule to another causing the heat to be conducted through the spoon. Then two, when we talk about movement of free electrons, in metals, the outermost electrons of the atoms are not tightly bound to the nuclei, so therefore they are free to move around. Now when the metal spoon is placed in the hot liquid, the electrons in the metals start absorbing thermal energy, okay, and move around with more kinetic energy. So as a result, some of the free electrons transfer their energy to the adjacent metal atoms through collisions, which then spread the thermal energy through the spoon. And there you have it for B1. Now B2, the metal spoon was replaced by a wooden spoon. Rachel observed that the wooden spoon did not feel hot. Explain why the wooden spoon did not feel hot. All right, so the wooden spoon did not feel hot because remember, wood is a poor conductor of heat compared to metal. When a wooden spoon is placed in a hot liquid, the heat is not conducted efficiently through the wood. And as a result, the handle of the, of the spoon does not heat up uh, as much as a metal would. Instead, the heat is mainly concentrated on the portion of the wooden spoon that is in contact with the hot liquid. Now, when we look at it from a molecular level, the wood is made up of long chains of cellulose fibers held together by weak hydrogen bonds. And these bonds do not allow for efficient transfer of thermal energy. Therefore, when the wooden spoon is placed in the hot liquid, the thermal energy from the liquid is mainly transferred to the liquid molecules in contact with the spoon. And very little of it is transferred to, through the wooden spoon itself. As a result, the handle of the wooden spoon remains relatively cool. And she can therefore pick it up their hand. With question 3C, a thermometer is placed in a plastic cup containing 200 grams of water and giving a reading and it gives us a reading of 22 degrees Celsius. A small piece of ice at 0 degrees Celsius is added to the water one by one. The mixture is stirred after each addition until the ice melts. Now the process was repeated until the temperature recorded by the thermometer was 0 degrees Celsius. So the total mass of ice added to the water was 60 grams. Now 3i is asking us to calculate the thermal energy lost by the original volume of water in the beaker. Given that the specific heat capacity of water is 4.2 joule, joule grams, joule per gram Celsius. All right. So first to calculate the thermal energy lost by the original volume of water in the beaker, we can use a formula Q is equal to MC delta T where Q is a thermal energy lost, M is the mass of water, C is the specific heat capacity of water, and delta T is a change in temperature. Now, initially, the temperature of water was 22 degrees Celsius. And when the ice melts, the temperature decreases to 0 degrees Celsius. So the change in temperature is T is equal to 0 degrees Celsius minus 22 degrees Celsius and that's going to give us negative 22 degrees Celsius. So the mass of the cup 
or mass of water in the cup is 200 grams. Therefore, the thermal energy lost by the water can be calculated as follows. So Q is equal to 200 grams times 4.2 joules per gram per Celsius times negative 22 degrees Celsius. The answer we should get is negative 1840 joules. So note that the negative sign indicates that thermal energy is lost by the water. Therefore, the thermal energy lost by the original volume of water in the beaker is 1840 joules. Then question two says that assume that all the energy lost by the original volume of water in the beaker is transferred to ice. So we're going to calculate the specific latent heat of fusion of ice. And we're going to use the formula Q is equal to M times L. So Q is the thermal energy transferred. We just calculated that um, M is the mass of the ice that, that has melted. And L is just the specific latent heat of fusion of ice. So in this case, we said the thermal energy lost by the water. We calculated that already. And that is equal to the thermal energy gained by the ice when it melts. So we are going to get Q is equal to negative 1840 all right so the mass of ice that melted can be calculated by just subtracting the final mass of ice from the initial mass of ice so remember six grams of ice was added to the water and remember all of that melted therefore that means that the mass of ice that has melted is six grams okay so substituting these values into the formula we're gonna get so q 1840 joules is equal to 6 grams times L. Then we're going to need to solve for L. Okay. Then we're going to have 18, negative 1840 joules over 6 grams. So we should get L is equal to 3080 joules per gram. The negative sign in the value of L is just due to the fact that the thermal energy lost by the water is equal in magnitude. But it is opposite in sign to the thermal energy gained by the ice. Okay, Ho however, the specific latent heat of fusion cannot be negative, so we're just going to take the absolute value of the result, right? So therefore, the specific latent heat of fusion of ice is 3080 joules per gram. Section B. So for A, name the electromagnetic waves in each of the regions labeled A, B, and C in the electromagnetic spectrum shown in figure five. So simply A is gonna be microwaves, B is UV rays, and C, those are gamma rays. And you get your three marks there. Okay, so figure six represents some wave forms approaching a barrier with a narrow gap, which is smaller than the wavelength, uh, wavelength of the wave. On figure six, draw three wave fronts after they have passed through the narrow gap. All right, so let us draw that real quick to show you what they would look like as they pass through the, the barrier. So let's draw that. So question C, define the term refractive index of glass. And the refractive index of glass is a measure of how much speed of how much the speed of light is reduced when it travels through a piece of glass compared to when it travels through a vacuum the refractive index of glass is 1.5 and it is a dimensionless quantity and is defined as the ratio of the speed of the light in a vacuum to the speed of light in the glass in other words it is a measure of how much the path of light is bent when it passes through a glass medium and it depends on the properties of the glass such as its composition and its density right d Figure 7 shows a ray, a red light incident on the face XY, okay, of a glass prism, prism at point S. The path of the ray is shown in the diagram. The refractive index N of the glass for, for red light is 1.5. So we are asked to calculate um, the angle of refraction in the glass at S, okay? So to calculate the angle of refraction, we, when we know everything else, okay, which is the angle of incidence, refractive index, and the incident medium, we can use Snell's law. And Snell's law relates the angle of incidence and refraction to the refractive index of the two media involved. So the law states that N1 times sine of I is equal to N2 times sine of R where N1 is the refractive index of the incident medium, I is the angle of incidence, N2 is the refractive index of the refracted medium, R is the angle of refraction, okay? So to solve the angle of refraction, we're going to rearrange the equation such that sine R is the subject, okay? So let's do that. 
then we can take the inverse sine of both sides. Take the inverse sine of both sides to obtain um, the following formula below. Okay, so where sine, where sine minus 1, sine to the power of minus 1 is really just the inverse sine function. We're going to calculate the angle of incidence in the glass at S. So here we have um, our answer. Okay, the answer has been worked out below. Question 2, calculate the critical angle C for glass to air. So the critical angle in the angle is the angle of incidence at which the refracted ray travels along the boundary of the two media rather than passing through the second medium. So this occurs when the angle of incidence is greater than the critical angle. So for glass and air, the refractive index of air is approximately 1, while the refractive index of glass varies depending on the type of glass. In this case, the refractive index of glass is 1. 0.5. All right, so here we here we are. We're gonna go ahead and work that out for you, and the answer that we should get, okay, is 42. All right, the answer we should get is 42. Now identify the critical angle C in Figure 7 on page 14, and the critical angle is labeled Z. Question five. Now question five A says that we, we should define the term electric field. And that is just a physical field that surrounds electrically charged particles and it exerts a force on all other charged particles in the field. All right, the force, the electric force per unit charge. Now question B1, we see a figure here and it says it shows a positively charged sphere which is attached to an insulated stand. Draw arrows to indicate the pattern and direction of the electric field in the region surrounding the sphere all right so here we go we're going to draw that for you right now so it's going to draw that too now a smaller charge uncharged metal sphere q is suspended by a cotton thread and brought close to the positively charged sphere as shown in figure nine so draw just draw the distribution of charge on um, sphere q all right so what is going on here is that when the charged metal sphere q is brought close to the positively charged sphere, the electric field of the positively charged sphere will induce a separation of charge in the, in the sphere Q. As a question three, an earth wire was briefly brought into contact with sphere Q as shown in figure 10, and then it will be removed. So describe what happens in the, in the wire and state the final charge on Q. All right, so if an earth wire is briefly brought in contact with sphere Q, and then is removed, any excess charge on sphere Q will be transferred to the earth wire, leaving sphere Q with a neutral charge. Okay, so that is question three. Moving on to question C, I. Now the battery in an electric car can be charged by passing a current of 11 amps through it. Calculate the charge stored in the battery after eight hours. Let us note a few things. So the current passing through the battery, they say, is 11 amps. So the time for which current flows, okay, is 8 hours. So let's bring it down to its SI unit. So 8 times 3,600 seconds. All right. So 8 times 3,600 seconds, that is going to be 28,000. Okay. So the formula we're going to use for, to calculate charge, okay, is charge is equal to current times the time. So 11 amps times 28,800. So we should get 316,800 coulombs. Let's move on to question three to calculate the resistance of, question two, sorry, calculate the resistance of the battery given that the voltage used is 220 volts, okay? Now we can use Ohm's law to calculate the resistance of the battery, all right? Now, Ohm's law tells us that the current passing through a conductor is directly proportional to the voltage applied across it and inversely proportional to the resistance of the conductor. So mathematically, it can be expressed as the current is equal to the voltage over the resistance. Okay, now we want to find the resistance, so we're going to rearrange the formula to solve for resistance. So R is equal to V over I. So the resistance of the battery can be calculated as 220 volts over 11 amps. So the resistance is 20 ohms. So let's go up to question 6A. They're asking us to complete 
the table by inserting the type of radioactive emission and their properties. All right. Now I'm just gonna go ahead and just fill in the blanks, tell you what tell you what is supposed to be in the blanks. So the radioactive emissions, so the first one is gamma rays, and it is can be easily stopped by lead or concrete. Can be stopped by lead or concrete. And the second blanks, set and set, set of blanks, alpha rays, and and the range is a few centimeters of air. And again, the last one here, beta rays okay or beta emissions okay can be stopped by aluminum foil okay or a few centimeters of water let's define the term isotopes now isotope those are just atoms of the same element they have the same atomic number but different mass number all right different mass number done to difference in number of neutrons now C, the structure of an atom of an element Y shows the number of neutrons, protons, and electrons is present in figure 11. The mass number is going to be 11, so that is the addition of the pro number of protons and neutrons in this, in this element. And the atomic number, guys, is 5 and 5. Why is it 5? Because the pro number of protons is what distinguishes one element from another. All right, so they also want us to write a symbol for another possible isotope of element Y. So one possible isotope would be where the mass number is 10, and of course, the atomic number is going to remain as 5. So D1, a polonium-210 nucleus decays by alpha particle emission to a lead nucleus. So we're going to complete the equation of the decay of polonium-210. So I'm going to write, go ahead and write what I have. So remember, guys, it's an alpha particle emission, so we're going to expect um, the removal of some he of helium. All right, the removal of helium is going to take some protons away with it, so that is why we have a change of polonium to lead. All right, because it emits an alpha particle. Two, polonium two hundred and ten has a half life of one hundred and thirty eight days. At a certain time, a sample contains six point four times ten. To the six polonium, polonium nuclei. So we're going to calculate the number of nuclei remaining after 512, 512 days. So I'm going to go ahead and look at and write the formula for you guys. So let's just try and understand what some of these things mean. So N sub zero is the initial number of polonium nuclei. All right. T tells us the amount of time that has elapsed. So T half is the half-life of polonium, which is 138 days. So all we're going to do is we're going to plug in the values, okay? We are going to plug in the values, and our answer, guys, is 4, four times 10 to the fifth. Therefore, the number of polonium nuclei remaining after 552 days is approximately 4.0 times 10 to the five okay so thank you for stopping by at study shock ja if you learned something from the video don't forget to drop us a comment like the video so that more people can see it and if you haven't already please subscribe to the channel so all the best in your exams and we'll talk soon